think that's the signal to start, Kasha. Am I right? Okay. Welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. I know the lunch is there, so it's a temptation not to join us, but at least you decided to dedicate this hour to not so much Brexit. We would like to discuss more the UK, if you allow me, because we are all tired, I think, to discuss Brexit for so many years. Uh, my name is Małgorzata Bonikowska. I want to thank the organizers uh, to uh, give us this chance to moderate this particular session. Uh, we are one of the oldest Polish independent think tanks in foreign affairs, 24 years. And uh, myself, I'm a political scientist, commentator. Uh, I teach at university, European studies and international relations. So I hope we'll have a great discussion. And let me just introduce briefly our guests. As you can see, the Brits are very, very well organized at least as far as panels and sessions, because they are all at the stage already. So let me briefly introduce your guests. Uh, we have with us a very good combination, actually, of people. So uh, Claire Moody, uh, Labour Party. She, uh, until this year, she was also a member of the European Parliament. She was working closely with uh, the Prime Minister Gordon Brown when he was at uh, uh, Downing Street number 10. Uh, and the labor, it, as far as Brexit, it means something. Uh, then we have uh, Dr. Julian Lewis, um, who is a conservative party representative, who is uh, actually, it has been a long time he's in the British Parliament, from 1997, and now he's a chair of Defense Select Committee in the Parliament, and he's very active in the uh, group of Leave Means Leave. So you can imagine what his position on Brexit would be. Uh, and then we have, um, uh, we have Dr. Julian um, Lindley French, um, very well known, I think, to the Polish experts and a very distinguished senior fellow uh, now in the uh, Institute of Statecraft, but also cooperating with Chatham House, uh, author of several books, so we can all follow what he thinks and he writes about. And we have our friend, uh, journalist and commentator, uh, Paul Taylor, uh, who is known to me because of his Reuters career and his column Inside Europe. So I think he knows Europe inside, from the inside, maybe better than us, uh, knowing Europe. And he looks at Britain maybe from two perspectives, the British and the European perspective as well. So I think I would uh, like to, because I want to give the floor to you as well, after a little while, I would like to divide our time into two sections. One would be uh, on the UK today. I would like to all of you, the question will be the same to all of you, if you can help us understanding really what is happening in the British uh, head, in, you know, in the hearts and minds of the Brits as a result of the Brexit process. Because what we can only see is it, with, it has been a long time, over three years, and it must have an impact both on the political situation and on the society. And then we will move to the future, how you see the after Brexit situation, both in the UK internally, what will be the future of the United Kingdom, and then what will be the relationship with the world, with the European Union in particular. So if I may start with the first question, what, what, what is, what has been the impact of Brexit on your country? Maybe we will start with the expert. Uh, microphones. Thank you very much. Instead of sitting, I, I don't know why you sit in the way that I'm sitting in the middle. It's very awkward for the moderator, but I will try. Better? Can you hear me? Very good. Carry on. Um, and I can remember being in my local pub on Lodgemoor, the sportsman, just before the referendum. Local pubs are very important. Th they are the font of all English knowledge and wisdom, particularly after three John Smith's Magnet Ales. Um, 
and they were all Brexiteers. I, I decided, I, I flirted with Brexit, but decided on balance that the, the EU was simply too important for Britain not to have influence over it, and therefore we needed to be inside rather than outside. But all my mates were leavers. And I asked them what the prevailing view was. And I think this is something that's not widely understood on much of the continent. It was, look, we can't vote for these people. We're handing power to these people, but we can't vote for them. Mm. And that was the prevailing view. And I'm a historian. And if you look back to the English Civil War, to the American Revolution, which came out of the English Civil War, that was the overriding factor. For, for in both conflicts, which was the relationship between the people and power and between voting and power. And it's very powerful in much of English political culture, almost instinctively so. So uh, although I'm a, a, an on-balance Remainer, I do have uh, Brexiteer sympathies because one has to look at where the EU will be in 30, 20, 30 years' time. Hmm. The EU is not going to stand still. And I have also some sympathy with David Cameron and his memoirs. At some point, the evolving political nature of the union had to be put to the British people. How do you do it and when is a different question. But given the change, yeah, it had to be a question that was asked. So you are consider you're, you're considering the situation in the EU as much as we are considering the situation in the UK. So let's yes, try because to we're inside the EU. Okay, fine. Uh, what about now the politicians? Let me leave the journalists at the end. Uh, Claire. So, <coughs> I'm going to start by disagreeing with Julian. Good, Claire. <laughs> How lovely. It's just always to, good. Just to keep the audience Very awake over lunch. Um, I would say that in the run-up to the referendum becoming a thing, it was not a topic of conversation. I have spent far too many years on doorsteps on Saturday mornings talking to complete strangers about politics and the EU just never came up in mm. that context of we've got to have a vote, we really disagree about our membership of the European Union. It is only since the referendum, since the short campaign and then obviously since the outcome that we are frankly as a nation obsessed by Brexit. There is no other political conversation. And it is causing deep frustration as well, because there are a huge number of social issues, there are a huge number of normal political issues, our health service, our education system, defense, all of these areas which we are not doing anything about because our political system is completely stuck on the system of Brexit. I don't and know if you like it or not, new but divide. we also discuss all the time the UK <laughs> now, which was not really the case before the referendum. So, <laughs> so what have you discovered by discussing all that over three years? Well, <laughs> not much more, I suspect. Um, you know, we also are discussing Brexit in the context still of the UK. So it is about Brexit being debated in Westminster, what's happening, whose you know, particular view of Brexit uh, has taken hold in Westminster. We're still not really better informed in the UK about the UK's role as it has been inside the European Union or indeed how the European Union works. It is still very much fog in the channel, Europe cut off. Mm -hmm. It's kind of this um, UK-focused conversation. But it is now, it's pretty fact-free. It's been mostly fact-free through, throughout the whole time. But it is sort of an article of faith now. And the trenches are getting deeper and further divided. So you now have more people emotionally uh, committed to one side of the debate or the other. And so the idea that you could kind of bring people back together is becoming further and further uh, away. With it rings the bell. I think I feel like almost in Poland, you know, we have also a very deep society division, so maybe it's a trend, I don't know. Uh, let's continue with politicians. I would like to ask you about uh, particularly how Brexit process, this long, you know, 
um, uh, long time we are dealing with this influences the British politics and the British mainstream parties, both actually. Well, I, I'd like to say that uh, I'm looking at this primarily through the prism of defense and Britain's role in defense. This is, after all, a security conference, and I chair a committee which has four parties represented amongst its 11 members. And the thought that I would ask people to take away if they forget everything else that I say is this. British Euroscepticism is not the same as isolationism. The strongest Eurosceptic believers in the British Parliament are amongst the strongest supporters of NATO and of US involvement in the defense of Europe. People like us believe that there is no security for the United Kingdom if it's not involved in contributing to the security of the continent of Europe, and there is no security for Europe, including the United Kingdom, if the United States are not fully committed to that. So for us, some of the worries about the EU stem from the vision of a common foreign policy, a common defense identity, which seems to us to replicate the good features of NATO, but without the essential feature, which is the involvement of the United States of America. And I would like to say something especially about the non-partisan approach to defense, because I can assure you that on my committee, there aren't even a majority of conservatives. There are five Labour, four conservatives, one Northern Ireland Democratic Unionist, and one Scottish nationalist. And do you know what? It doesn't bother me at all as chairman which turn up and which don't, because we all believe in a strong NATO, an increase in the defense budget, not from two to 2%, but to 3%, which is what we feel it ought to be. And the question of our membership of the European Union is overwhelmingly irrelevant to our belief in the need for a strong NATO with American involvement. And finally, I just say this, if our country had had the misfortune, as Poland did, to spend 40 years under Soviet repression, I'm sure we would have wanted to join every Western multinational organization going when the opportunity came. But the difference is that whereas NATO today is recognizably the same organization, though with many more members than it was in 1949, the European Union is on a journey to a different system of political rule, which is a system that people like me, and there are a lot of us, and we're not all mad, contrary to what a distinguished American speaker said yesterday, uh, it's very different from the sort of system by which we wish to be governed. Thank you for this statement, because I think especially during this forum, it's a very important uh, domain of discussion, so thank you for that. Uh, and let me go to, uh, to Paul, because he sees the situation also from a little bit from the EU perspective. But I would like also to ask you if there is any change in the perception of the EU in Britain during this all, you know, Brexit process. Ha. Huh. Um. So let me start, if I may, by the other side, by the perception of Britain in, uh, by, um, among European countries and po uh, public opinion and so on. Because I think that's one of the big changes, is that people, including in this country, Poland, my Polish friends, used to look to the UK as a font of uh, uh, democratic stability, of pragmatism, of uh, a spirit of common sense and compromise uh, and as you know one of the most uh, stable democracies that they wanted to emulate and I know that their perception of the UK has been changed by the shock of seeing the virulence of the debate the hostility uh, the difficulty of the institutions in coping with this 
uh, the, 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 the question of parliament, uh, parliamentary sovereignty versus the powers of the government, whether the Queen gets dragged in, whether the Prime Minister lies to the Queen or not and uh, uh, has or has not the right to provoke Parliament when it doesn't suit him for them to be debating, uh, the question of whether Parliament has the power to or should have the power or not uh, to postpone Brexit or to stop Brexit, all of these things um, have raised questions about the UK Constitution which people hadn't really thought about before. Um, so I think there's been a sense also in the uh, uh, very uh, uh, odd way in which the UK conducted these negotiations throughout. And I mean, the oddest thing is that we're three weeks away from the latest deadline for Brexit and nobody on this panel really has the slightest clue what's going to happen. And, you know, we don't even know, will there be a negotiation? Will there be more extra time played? Will, it, will there be a penalty shootout? Um, I don't think there'll be a second referendum, but I can't be sure of that. Uh, I don't think it would be a good idea, personally, um, because I thought the first referendum was not a good idea either. I don't believe in government by referendum. Um, I believe in parliamentary democracy, but parliamentary democracy has had a very difficult time. So it's changed people's perceptions. And that, I'm afraid, over time also diminishes Britain's soft power. But are the Brits aware of that? Some of them are. Uh, I think many of them are too busy in the midst of this national nervous breakdown over uh, Brexit to really think uh, about how, how anybody else looks at them. You know, the people who are going through a sort of a psychosis of some sort rarely think about how they're seen from outside. They're too caught up in it themselves. And uh, it's a bit, you know, it's taken on almost the sort of aspect of the, the Dreyfus affair in France at the end of the 19th century, turn of the 20th century. There's a wonderful, famous cartoon where you see a family Sunday lunch and, and there's lots of shattered crockery on the, uh, on the floor and people's uh, clothes are torn and their hair stands on end. And the caption is simply, ils en ont parlé, they talked about it. <laughs> and I can tell you that in my sister's house in London, I sometimes think that in the kitchen there's sort of an invisible swear box where, you know, if you mention the B word, you have to put a, a shilling or as it now is a pound. So the, the, the one thing I can say with certainty about this is that if and when Brexit happens, either at the end of this month or at some other time, I do believe it will happen, um, it won't be the end. We will go on tearing ourselves apart over Europe for a very long time, certainly the rest of my lifetime. Um, firstly, because, you know, the, 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 whether we go over a cliff or whether we come to some uh, arrangement and have an orderly exit, you know, that's only the first stage. There's still the whole question of what's our future relationship with the EU going to be. Personally, I believe that the Brexit was driven by an outmoded, almost 19th century view of sovereignty, a view that um, we perhaps heard a little bit of um, from our Polish speaker this morning, although he did emphasize how important it was for Poland to be in the EU as well, which is interesting to hear. Um, you know, the world has moved on. Sovereignty is not absolute, it's relative. I know that there's a, a trend around the world at the moment to try and rediscover, reinvent absolute sovereignty. But the fact is, the problems we face, whether it be on trade, whether it be on climate change, uh, whether it be on migration and so on, are not amenable to absolute sovereignty and national solutions. They can only be solved um, by some forms of international governance. And the UK used to accept that. We have a habit as, the, as a country of joining clubs afterwards rather than when they're necessarily when they're set up. You know, the, the, there's a British saying, if you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> um, now I think there seems to be the, an attitude, if, if you can't beat them, leave them. Uh, I'm not sure it's going to be such a, a happy outcome. Well, I think, you know, what is interesting maybe to notice, I don't know if you've noticed that, that we are having this panel uh, more on the UK than on Brexit, actually, between two other sessions. One was on Russia, and another will be on Ukraine. I think this wouldn't happen definitely before 2016. We didn't discuss the UK in these uh, terms. 
But I would like to go back to my, uh, my question, because we really, in Europe, we want to understand what is going on in this country. I think we lost somehow, you know, the understanding. So going back to the, to the situation, internal situation in the UK, my question would be, especially to the politicians, do you expect the political scene in the UK changing more because of this division in the society, because the division is around Brexit today? While the political parties are not really divided like this, your parties are internally divided around Brexit. Then there we have a pro-Brexit party of Mr. Farage, but we don't really have a, an open pro-Remain party. Well, yes, but not with a, now it's picking up, right? But it's this pro-Remain line was not so strong. And then it's changing or this is only a short, you know, trend, or this will be like a permanent trend to remodel somehow the internal political scene in the UK? How do you see that? First politicians, please. Claire? Yeah, so uh, my party, the Labour Party, is its centre of gravity is absolutely pro-European. It's, uh, we are historically, traditionally an internationalist party. We believe in cooperation and uh, you know, working together collectively to deliver change. And so I, you know, the polling suggests you know, over 80% of our party membership. You know, I would say it's a similar number of our MPs and actually also with our voters, Labour voters, even in leave voting constituencies, the majority of the Labour vote, uh, where you have a Labour MP, is, is still pro-European or pro-Remain. But you didn't so, take this line. You didn't uh, take this well, line. You know, it, there is a difficult uh, balancing act being carried out by our leadership. One could argue whether it is being done elegantly or not. <laughs> and, uh, you know, around trying to uh, you know, ensure that we can talk to the voters in those Leave voting constituencies in the election. It is no secret that I think we ought to be taking a firmer position than uh, the leadership opted for at our most recent party conference. But your question about why aren't the parties neatly slipping into the slipstream of either side of the debate, and I go back to my point earlier that this is a new schism in the British political system. This is not something that you know, has you know, been heartfelt in our politics, except by those people, those sort of minorities at either side of each party that had a deep felt passion for this. On the whole, the rest of us were just quite happy to get on with life and deal with our politics uh, on a more generalist basis. So, yeah, but we it had, is you had some bad results. You had splits in the party, your party also. There were some MPs who left the party. So there is a. But that's post, that's post yes. the vote. Yes. What yes. I'm talking about is your. Yeah, this is a relatively recent political phenomenon. But I'm talking about the future. So Do you expect this to continue? I mean, this kind of a changing, you know, the political scene in the UK, or do you think it will step, you know, get I stable? I think Paul is absolutely right. I think this is now going to dominate our politics for, you know, years and years to come. Yeah, you know, we are not going to resolve our future relationship. The current debate that is going on in the UK is about the divorce deal. We haven't really begun arguing properly about the future relationship yet. There's some of that in engaged in the backstop conversation, but the reality is we're not even near the end of the beginning right hmm. now. We've got a whole lot of argument to run through yet. And that depresses me enormously because, as I say, there are loads of things in the UK that actually our politics need to be focused on that we aren't even beginning to look at right now. We are saying the same in the, on the continent. We are saying oh, how many times we should deal with Brexit, we should face some other even more important issues, but we don't have time. We have to always talk about Brexit. So, Dr. Lewis, how you see just... I'm slightly more optimistic. I think that in the run-up to our departure, because there is no real indication at the moment 
who will prevail in terms of whether the departure will be a deal similar to uh, the area in the spectrum that Theresa May tried, which is a supremely soft Brexit. In fact, so soft a Brexit that somebody like me would have seriously considered voting Remain rather than voting for her sort of Brexit because of its removal of any future exit mechanism, for example. So you could have a deal that was a very, very soft Brexit. You could have a deal that was much nearer uh, what uh, the conservative Eurosceptic wing would like to see, or you could have no deal at all. But once we know which of those things it is, I'm sure Paul is right. I'm sure this will rumble on and on and on, but some of the heat will go out of the situation because obviously people at the moment think there's everything to play for because nobody knows which sort of exit we're going to have. And what's more, the Liberal Democrat Party, who are not represented here today, so I won't be too nasty about them, the Liberal Democrat Party, who are always the great advocates of having a referendum and who actually argued when some of us wanted a referendum on the Lisbon Treaty, they said, no, 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 what you need is a real referendum on the key question, should we stay or should we leave? Well, anyway, the Liberal Democrats have now come out firmly for the fact that they want to revoke Article 50 irrespective of any way that the people have voted. So, uh, you know, this will all rumble on. When I was uh, an undergraduate in the 1970s uh, studying the theory of international relations, I was once set an essay to write about integration theory. And it was all about how nations could be drawn slowly and imperceptibly to merge their political systems. And I remember I poo-pooed it and I said, no, 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 nations have got a very clear sense of their own interests and when they see they're being drawn in a direction they don't want to go, they'll stop, they'll turn around and go back. Well, I apologize, I was wrong. I underestimated the power of this form of creeping integration. And it has been an issue for those of us who don't like it, for the last 40 years. But do you know what? Other issues go on getting resolved. And when the worst of this storm is over, and when one way or the other we know what sort of exit we're going to have, then the arguments will go on. But as I tried to indicate about my comments about defense in the first place, we are not going to let this divisive issue, which cuts across everything else, divide us on the issues with which we agree. And people like Claire and I in our respective parties who are totally wedded to the idea of a strong NATO and the vital role of America in defending Europe and us making a key contribution to it will not, I trust, allow our differences on Brexit to divide us. No. Yeah. Claire, at the bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> sorry, Julia. Very quickly. Julian was first. You go first. Thank you. No, I was going to say, Claire, I was invited to my pub in Sheffield. Great. Um, Neo-functionalism, Julian, I, I, that takes me back. Look, part of the problem, if I may say so, is the continental view of the, of the, of the British political system as being Victorian, as being Erskine May, as being extremely civilized. If you look at history, we've often had tumultuous points. If we look at the way that the House of Commons is built, the opposition and government stand two and a half sword lengths apart to avoid a fracas becoming fatal, which could have happened last week if they'd had swords. Um, so part of it is a cliche uh, view. And I think uh, Britain is a country that is evolving fast into a federated system. And all those traditional structures are, are being challenged by this change, which goes way beyond Brexit. Tony Blair's reform, Supreme Court, uh, devolution, all bring questions of governance of the United Kingdom into question. Um, there's also an assumption that I hear often, I live in the Netherlands, so I get this on the, on the Dutch side of this, that somehow the EU is locked into a, a kind of parabolic trajectory forward. But I had a meeting at the Bundesbank recently where they, they've presented the scenarios for the Euro, <coughs> and they're frightening. Christine Lagarde mentioned it, that unless the Euro can be fixed at a project, given the coming recession which the Bundesbank believes is coming, there are no tools left in the kit box to fix the euro in an emergency. 
If the euro goes into meltdown, the attitudes in the UK will evolve again. Because to my mind, the Eurozone and the EU are the core project. Uh, so much rests upon that. And I would ask you to, uh, to look at the fundamentals of Britain. Last week, the second of our 70,000 ton aircraft carriers, HMS Prince of Wales, began her sea trials. Britain is still a major power in Europe and indeed beyond. We spend five times what Poland spends on defense. Our economy is over five times as big. Now, there may be some adjustments at the, at the margins of that, but I do not see the EU, even though I think Britain should be within it for a whole host of geopolitical reasons, I do not see the EU as the driver of economic growth in this world. One of the reasons I want Britain to stay in is a conversation I had with a very senior German in Berlin before the referendum. How important it was to have Britain alongside Germany to reform the fundamentals of the Union to the Lisbon agenda can make Europe more competitive in the 21st century world. And I do fear that what Brexit has, has enabled some Europe, of our fellow Europeans to do is to create an alibi as to why Europe as a whole should not look at its place in the world, but rather focus on an internal uh, a fractious debate. Mm. Paul? Well, I'd, I'd like to sort of pick up where, where Julian, well, the Julians, if I may say so, <laughs> left off and, and try and look a bit more about, you know, what Britain's going to be like after Brexit. And I'm not talking mainly about the domestic politics, but Britain uh, in the world. Um, if I had to sum it up in a journalistic uh, uh, exaggeration, I would say it'll be more mouth and less trousers. <laughs> That's to say, you know, we will, we will, let's think about the fundamentals, as you said. We will remain uh, a nuclear power with a permanent UN Security Council seat. We'll be the world's fifth or sixth, perhaps sixth economy. Um, we will have the biggest defense budget in Europe, um, which has just had a little uplift. Um, um, I, I see that Julian talks about the ambition to have a, a budget of three, uh, a defense budget of 3% of GDP. I just hope that that isn't achieved by uh, shrinking GDP until <laughs> constant defense spending becomes 3% of it. The one thing we can say with certainty is um, sterling has depreciated by 15% since uh, uh, the referendum, and many people in the financial markets, especially if we have a no-deal Brexit, think it could go down by another 15%. I speak as somebody whose pension is in sterling and whose costs are in euro. Um, and, you know, that buys you less bang for the quid uh, because many of our defense costs are in dollars. Um, we will continue to have, you know, a tremendous intelligence capability, cyber power, special forces, um, and uh, expeditionary forces that um, will continue to be, uh, to excel. However, and of course we'll continue, I, I, I should say, I, I want to be scrupulously fair as I was taught to be at Reuters, we will continue to be in multiple power networks. Uh, one of them, of course, is NATO, and I think in fact we will try to overcompensate by doing more in NATO and trying also to run more business through NATO. We may meet re some resistance by people saying, wait a second, this is EU business, this is not for NATO. Um, but we will be, you know, we have other power networks in which we are players. The Commonwealth, I think it's greatly exaggerated by some people in the, in the UK, but it's there. Um, the groupings that we've formed with Northern European countries uh, around uh, joint uh, task forces, expeditionary uh, forces, um, but I think we will suffer a major loss of influence by leaving the EU table. Uh, a, a, a loss of influence particularly in the areas where it's the EU that really holds uh, the power, and that is trade, sanctions, um, a whole range of regulation, competition policy, um, and the, many of the tools of soft power which lie with the EU and not with NATO. The variables, well, as we've seen, uh, our inward political focus and the rise of English nationalism, which has really been at the heart of this Brexit movement, um, you know, raised the question, will the UK survive? And Norman Davis addressed that eloquently last night. Um, 
you know, will we end up with little England uh, instead of Great Britain? I can't be sure one way or the other. I think the chances of the UK breaking up are, are incre would be increased uh, substantially by a no-deal Brexit. I, can, I think that's just a, uh, a fact of life. Um, and if there is a no-deal Brexit, then we will have, for a sustained period, a much weaker economy and currency. That means less money for government spending altogether, not just for defense, but for all of government spending. And we have a government that has made lavish pro uh, promises to build hospitals, to build high-speed rail lines, to heal Britain's deep social fractures. Um, so, you know, how much international focus will there be? How much money will there really be for defense? I raise that question. Um, the final thing, we've sort of mortgaged our defense de budget rather a lot to two aircraft carriers and the, and the planes that go on them um, and to modernizing our nuclear deterrent. And I just asked the question, how useful is that going to be in 21st century security? It's a question rather than an answer. Yeah, at this point, I, I, I wanted also to add to a list of questions to you. Um, the question about Russia and Russian influence or interference in your referendum. This was a question raised, and there was a, uh, the, the investigation started in 2017, I guess. So it would be good to also hear your comments on that, Claire. Thank you. Um, actually, it's a pertinent point to what I was going to come back to say to uh, Julian earlier on, which is, Although he validly makes the point about the uh, shared commitments when it comes to the defense sphere, actually it's one of the reasons I am also so opposed to Brexit because of the, uh, you know, the, there are factors that have been raised, you know, the relationship with the US, well actually one of the UK's strengths was, or perceived strengths, was it as a bridgehead between the US and the EU and was therefore, and we will lose that if we take ourselves out of the EU. Um, secondly is uh, the point around, for example, those bodies like the PSC and our role in the PSC and if we're taking ourselves out of that also, then we're losing that uh, relationship, we're losing that informal and formal power structure and we actually on a very practical point take ourselves out of the um, databases that are necessary for our own internal defense as well as the uh, when you're looking at external defense as well. On your point about uh, Russia, um, I also have the pleasure to live in a little city in England called Salisbury. And so, mm. uh, the, the courtesy of the Russian tourist board, a lot of people now know about the spire of our cathedral. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we, we recently had the incident with the uh, poisoning of Scripple, and unfortunately a resident of Salisbury also died in that incident. But because, largely because, not exclusively, but because of our membership of the European Union, we were able to work with other EU colleagues as well as elsewhere around the world to ensure there was a solid response to that attack on our sovereign territory. So you know, that actually also was an illustration of why being part of different organizations, the European Union and NATO, have complementary benefits for us when we're dealing with our own defense, as in what happened with Salisbury, but actually also in 2014 with what happened with uh, Ukraine and Crimea. All of this means we have a stronger front. And I am worried that Brexit makes us part of the problem and not part of the solution that we uh, are collectively trying to deal with in, uh, in this conference, but on our day-to-day -day basis as well. And the asymmetric point about the interference and the idea that we're dealing with this, um, yeah, kind of the troll factories, whatever it is, the um, cyber interference, um, I think Particularly it's around Brexit referendum itself, because yeah. it poses the question to the whole process. Absolutely, and our, it comes to the point of the testing 
of our democracy. And this is another area that is being tested and it is being proven that we are insufficiently capable of defending ourselves against this, our electoral law, um, our you know, kind of capabilities in the digital sphere, uh, in the poli as politicians, never mind anything else, means we simply haven't got the defenses to protect our democracies at this point. I think that we're going to have to Let's evolve Let's speak the defense that. committee. Okay. okay, well, there's a lot to come back on there, and I can't do it all in the depth that I'd like. But let me just refer to a few of the points. So in relation to uh, the, the value of carriers or the nuclear deterrent, can I make it quite clear, as far as British strategy is concerned, the value of Britain having an independent nuclear deterrent is every bit as relevant today and will be every bit as relevant tomorrow as it has been throughout its lifetime. Because the purpose of a nuclear deterrent is to make sure that our country can never successfully be subjected to nuclear blackmail or attack with impunity, and that does not change. And just to remind people that, and I use this as an illustration of the irrelevance of Brexit to certain key defense issues, that irrespective of, of the Brexit vote, the vote to renew the fleet of Trident submarines with the strong support of my friends on the labor, on the labor benches and on ours in a parliament of just under 650 sitting members had a majority uh, in July 2016 after the referendum vote. It was one of the first things that happened under Theresa May, the renewal vote for the nuclear deterrent fleet. The majority, not the vote, the majority was 355 in favor of renewal. So let's not try and drag that in. Where it's relevant, and where the carriers are relevant, and where the amphibious ships, Albion and Bulwark, uh, which are the land complement to the air component that's supplied by the carriers are relevant, is this. We do not know what conflicts in what parts of the world Britain will be involved in for the next 30, 40, or 50 years. And that is why we need to retain, irrespective of 21st century threats, about which more in just a moment, we need to retain the ability to deploy land forces by sea, and we need to retain the ability to exercise air power by sea. And it was the Labour Party's excellent strategic defense review in 1998 that came up with that concept. Now, since 1998, of course, Russia has come back as an adversary. But the point about all this is that just because we face new 21st century threats of the type so accurately described by Paul and Claire, that is no reason for saying that the need for an effective army, navy, or air force has gone away. And when I talk about 3%, I must remind everybody that in the 1980s, in the mid-1980s, the British were not spending 3% of GDP on defense, let alone a bare 2% as at present. They were spending regularly between 45 and 5% of GDP on defense, and that was roughly equivalent to what we were spending on education and on health. We now spend two and a half times on education and over four times on health what we spend on defense. So forgive me if I'm not wholly convinced that the arguments about Brexit are the root of our problem and the dilemma that Paul highlights that how can we afford to pay for big ticket items uh, if we're facing also war in the gray zone and so forth. The answer is we must have a much bigger defense budget. And I'm pleased to say a lot of people in all the four parties represented on the Defense Committee agree with that statement. Well, time so flies. So you're ready to cut health and education spending to achieve that? Do you want me to answer that? Uh, yes. Just a question, yeah. Uh, well, but my answer is quite simply that defense has fallen too far down the list of our national priorities. Uh, I am not proposing at this stage 
to say that we have to go back to the last time uh, that we were in a situation faced by an aggressive Russia and a major terrorist threat, then Irish republicanism, now uh, in Islamism and totalitarian Islamism at that. I'm not saying we have to go back to four and a half and, and, and five percent of GDP, but that's why we feel, after a detailed consideration of it, that a medium-term goal of three percent of GDP for a country like ours, with the place in the world and the power that it's still got and wants to occupy, should be a realistic goal. Okay, before I continue, I just want to check if there is anybody. Yeah, please. That's the time for you. Um, yes, we don't see much, but I hope, yeah, there are some questions over there. Uh, hello, Przemysław Biskup, the Polish Institute of International Affairs. Uh, Could you speak up, because we have... Yes, um, Przemysław Biskup, the Polish Institute of International Affairs. I would be very much interested in the opinion of all the panelists on the priorities if there are cuts to the defense budget. Where, what will be protected within uh, that, that budget and where will be the biggest cuts, especially in the context of the British presence uh, on the eastern flank? Thank you. Yes, please, here and three more questions here. Hello, Brian Griffin, new security leader. Um, among conversations this whole week of Russia and China and all these threats that we're facing, uh, the most alarming comment I've heard yet is that sovereignty is now relative and we have to have some new notion of what that is and continue to seed it over. And we're facing the same challenge or the same debate in America. And a lot of people voted for Trump because they were worried about their own sovereignty, handing things over to an unelected elite. So if you want us to buy that notion, then are we having conversations about where it stops, where we stop ceding our own sovereignty, how large the unelected elite gets, and just how much of our lives we no longer have control the over? question, please. Just gave it. Okay. Uh, then here, three people here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Tania Latish from the think tank of the European Parliament. I would like to pick Could up... Could you just... Sorry. Pick, uh, I'd like to pick up on two things that Paul said. The first being that the UK will likely overcompensate on its activities in NATO. So I'd like to, to ask if, you, if you'd see the UK using this, let's say, excess defense energy in NATO also to bridge EU-NATO cooperation, so to use its networks and its knowledge from both, in, from both organizations to, to further this path. And the second one on the, on the influence question. Please um, put the mic, because we hardly hear. Sorry. Just close. I, I try. Um, so on the influence question, I don't think anybody in this room is contesting the importance of the, of the US on, for European security. And I, do, I, and I really am an admirer of British strategic thought. But I, I have to ask, isn't it frightening to think about the prospect of, of the UK being stuck in a deeply asymmetrical relationship with the US and potentially being stuck in a, in a future subservient uh, relationship with the US? Thank you. We have one more question, or two more questions here, one question here, and I think, yes, one more here. And Hi that's everyone, it. Alexandra Shokievich, I'm political risk analyst for Control Risk. Um, I have a question you touched briefly upon this, actually. It concerns Ireland. Um, how do you see the different Brexit scenarios play out for security implications for Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, and also further down the road, political implications? What's the prospect for EU reunification? Thank you. Okay, please. Uh, Henry Foy, uh, Financial Times. Um, Julian Lewis, you, you make a very good point about defense spending and how the UK will be committed to European defense because we're a major power. But i based in Moscow. Mr. Putin doesn't worry too much about tanks and missiles. He worries about influence in the EU. And we're already seeing how Mr. Macron and, and French and German politicians are looking to be more friendly with Russia. Britain is a major hawkish power. And when it steps out of that space, trade, investment, bilateral relations, cybersecurity, these are issues where Mr. Putin wants to be friendly with the EU, and he doesn't really care too much about military bases. Thank you. Thank you. Question here. And the last one over there. Janusz Waniszkiewicz, Euro Atlantic Association. Well, two questions. One is concerned with the British readiness to be part of the European sort of defense 
the posture. What, kind, what sort of institutional framework uh, this can be, uh, this British involvement could be actually, uh, mater could, could materialize? What would be, what, what, would that be in the form of European Security Council or, or whatever? And the second, the, to what extent British defense industry could be somehow involved in this major program of developing the European defense uh, industry capability, especially versus American challenge or Chinese challenge. Thank you. And the last question here. Uh, thank you. Um, Mitchell Ornstein from University of Pennsylvania. I have a question for uh, Dr. Uh, Lewis. So you made a rousing defense of the idea that this will not change, that uh, British nuclear deterrence will not change, and yet, as a result of Brexit, and yet one of the impacts of Brexit may be that Scotland decides to leave the U UK. My question to you is simply, what are the implications of that for Britain's nuclear deterrence, and has your committee made um, careful and thoughtful preparations for a Scottish uh, exit? So I guess we'll start with Dr. Lewis. So many questions. Well, I, uh, forgive me if I don't answer all of them. I'll do my, my best and I'll do as, as, as very briefly as I can. Uh, let me just remind uh, our friend from Pennsylvania that the Scottish National Party uh, was um, advocating the departure uh, of Scotland previously, and it will go on advocating it into the future, and the people of Scotland will decide. And um, we, this was something that had to be faced up to when we had a referendum by the people of Scotland. And on that occasion, it was supposed to be accepted for a generation, although funnily enough, that referendum is still being contested and another one is being demanded. But the truth of the matter is that in the, what I believe, unlikely event that Scotland voted to uh, separate from the United Kingdom, I am absolutely convinced that alternative arrangements would be made for the continuation of the British nuclear deterrent. There is not the slightest doubt in my mind uh, that uh, the nuclear deterrent would uh, carry on, uh, but though obviously it would cease to be based in Scotland. Um, I'm afraid I couldn't quite follow all the points that were made by the penultimate questioner, but I, I did hear what he said about the European defense industry, and I think he said about the framework for cooperation with Europe, and here I think it's worth looking at the the government, I should say the then government's response in 2018 to a report that the Defense Committee did on our future defense relationship with the EU. And this was at the time that Theresa May was hoping to get her deal through. And what the government said, and this I don't think is likely to have changed very much at all because this is largely officials uh, in the Ministry of Defense. Um, and what they said was, we are open to taking part in EU operations or missions where this is in our mutual interest. This would be on a case-by-case -case basis and subject to establishing adequate mechanisms for consultation. However, the government is clear that it would not deploy UK troops to any CSDP operation or mission unless we were fully satisfied with the objectives, military plans, and execution of the operation or mission in question. So in other words, we will decide as a sovereign nation uh, on what occasions we wish to be involved in EU military operations. But I must go back to this point that I think I'm right in saying that I think the figure is 23 members of the EU are also members of NATO. So if we're talking about serious threats involving Russia or some other major power, to European states, then in reality, NATO is going to be what's going to be involved and what's going to be in the lead. And the EU has difficulty in carving out scenarios where it would be involved, where NATO wouldn't be. But there's one scenario that it could be, which I regard as very frightening. I regard it as extremely worrying that a future European Union with a common foreign and defense policy could give security guarantees to non-NATO countries 
and that because America was not involved in the issuing of that guarantee, the Russians might feel that there was a gamble they could take. They might well be wrong, and it might be that America would come to the aid of the European Union, but they would find out that mistake only when it was too late for everyone concerned. So these are one of the many reasons why uh, I believe in the closest possible bilateral and multilateral relationship with our friends on the European continent. I believe in the supremacy of the NATO multilateral relationship and the absolute indispensability of the American component to it. With regard to our friend from the Financial Times saying Mr. Putin isn't all that bothered about military power, well, there's a very good reason for that, and that is, through all the years of the Cold War, we've been strong enough to show leaders in a potentially hostile and aggressive Russia that they better not be bothered about the military power angle, because if they start something like that, the consequences for them will be catastrophic. But you start dismantling and shrinking our military power, and you wait to see how Mr. Putin's attitude changes. And I reiterate what I said before. You're absolutely right about the new 21st century threats and the competition for influence, but these are additional to and not substitutes for the sort of traditional threats for which military is, is required. I could go on about other answers, but I think I'd better let other people have a go, and if there's time, I'm happy to come back to other questions. And maybe you just can answer to uh, which one? question uh, about uh, how the budget will be... Is, is oh, which cuts or something. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I, I was very taken aback by that. I, I, mean, I, I, I mean, the last thing I propose to, to see are, are cuts at all. I mean, that's the whole thing. Uh, what we are campaigning for, just as now that we have secured the continuation, hopefully for the next 35 or 40 years, of the British independent strategic nuclear deterrent, God bless her and all who sail in her, um, now that we've secured that, our next objective, far from having further cuts, and there were terrible cuts under the Cameron Conservative Lib Dem coalition uh, in, in, in 2010, far from further cuts, what we need to see is a reversal of that situation. And it's worrying when people say, oh, well, Britain spends more than any other country in the EU. Um, well, all I can say is don't use that as your yardstick because Britain isn't spending nearly enough. Julian, and then... Yeah, I, I'm to going to make this a final word. I mean, there's a simple solution to this nuclear dilemma. Take the cost of the deterrent back out of the defence budget and put it in the contingency reserve of the state as it was until 2009. It's, it, and it will free up a lot of money for the conventional deterrent that we are building. The carriers. No one's talked about burden sharing here with the United States. The rise of China means that the United States will need Europeans to be effective first responders in an emergency. The carriers are the heart of a coalition task group in the North Atlantic and the Western approaches, which will take the pressure off the United States. This is real burden sharing with the Americans in the event of an emergency. Intelligence. I had a meeting a, few, a couple of years ago with a senior commission official about being locked out of intelligence. And my response was, so where are you going to get it then? Britain provides 70% via or direct of all the raw intelligence used by the EU. The loss of access to what Britain can provide would be a massive loss to the EU's ability to, conduct, to build those databases. Um, and same with counter cyber, by the way. The Brits are well ahead of anybody else on, on counter cyber. Um, on CSDP, and this is where I disagree with Julian. I speak to heads of state and government around Europe. I see no evidence or desire, apart from a few, should we say, extreme individuals, that they want to build a common defense along the lines of the European defense community. I just don't see it. I, do, I see, I see the, 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 a deeply integrated collective European effort, in which I believe, which is NATO compatible. You'll hear that no stronger than in Paris, where they also believe fundamentally in that. And Paris is desperate that we remain close to this through the E2I of President Macron. Why? Because Britain and France have always driven this together. And the fundamentals of defense, irrespective of institutions, will demand that that continues. And one final word on Ireland, which was 
a question that we're all dodging. You know, I'm a Democrat in the same way that I would respect Scottish independence. If the people of the island of Ireland at some point wish to be a republic of the island of Ireland, I'd support it. At some point, I suspect that that will have to be tested at the ballot box. And like all Democrats, I would respect the result in the same way that I'm a Remainer who respects the result of the 2016 Brexit referendum. Thank you. Claire and then Paul. Thank you. Uh, OK, so um, picking up where the last Julian left off in terms of what will happen uh, with the UK as a whole, because that is another thing that the Brexit referendum has done, is call into question whether the UK will survive this Brexit debate. We are now, uh, you know, uh, Scotland will argue very strongly, or the SNP government in Scotland will argue very strongly, that the game has changed if we leave the European Union in terms of what the decision was, the decision that was made in, uh, 20, in their referendum in 2014. And I do not recall a realistic prospect of a united Ireland ever in my life, even when we were in the depths of the troubles or anything uh, like that. Uh, it's now actively being discussed. And exactly as the last Julian said, you know, it will be if there is a border poll and the outcome is that, then, you know, uh, and I think there's been a lot of alienation. And it comes to another point around the divisions, in effect, you know, responding to your earlier question, which is um, the, you know, people feel very remote from Westminster and our political system in the UK. And again, that's another kind of underlying thread in what's happening in the UK. So if you live in the northeast of England or if you live in Cornwall, in the very southwest of England, never mind Scotland or Northern Ireland, you just don't think the system is responding to you, that it is there to serve you because of that disconnect. It's a long-standing disconnect. It has very little to do with Brexit, certainly in the remote, in the uh, the regions of England, but it is there. So I fear that Brexit may result not just in a debate where we hear from Little England, as I fear it may actually end up with a Little England. Um, the sovereignty question that came about, and the question of relative sovereignty, and again, indeed it was touched on earlier, uh, I, I find it slightly ironic that some of the people, and again, you take bits of each of the debate, but some of the people that drove Brexit and drove this debate around sovereignty also lean back into the Commonwealth because they're leaning back into a history of the UK uh, and our position in the world. And I have to say, we didn't do an awful lot for the sovereignty of a whole load of countries around the world. We were not too fussed about the sovereignty of India or indeed of other countries either. So you know, the concept of relative sovereignty is indeed a very relative concept in the minds of some as well. Uh, and it is the fact that we are in a global world and we are cooperating and we collaborate and we share decision-making in all sorts of spheres, including in NATO and elsewhere. And the EU is not undemocratic because I sat in the European <laughs> Parliament for five years. Um, finally, just quickly on the, um, the institutional framework and the EDF. Uh, Dr. Lewis Julian, <laughs> I don't think you answered that one with your response in terms of the government response. The government merely reiterated the existing position inside the uh, uh, CSDP. And we are very disengaged. You know, Georgia arguably plays more of a role in some of the CSDP missions than the UK does. And also by just saying, we will do this, and that's what the British government said, does not recognize the fact that this is actually not going to be the same situation or the same scenario. So yeah, we are in entering a different world. And there is an evolving reality that was represented in the question around the European Defense Fund and the wider conversations that are going to go on with that and the research that happens around that. So 
And finally, the asymmetric relationship with the US, and that is indeed a question that uh, uh, is you know, sort of troubling a lot of people inside the UK as well. We are in a very different relationship and power position outside the EU than we were as a central part of the EU. Well, Last word. So let me, we have to, yeah, yeah we have to finish. Okay, can we, let, can we release Julian? Can I, I thank you very much uh, for, for this discussion. I, I'd like to try and answer a couple of the questions that the others didn't address and I accept well, everything that they've said, although I could con contradict it, some of it. Um, but the question about a relationship with America, we're going to be much more dependent on and behoven to the United States after Brexit, especially if it's a no-deal Brexit. Again, this thing is crucial. If we have an orderly Brexit, the whole thing will be smoother economically, it will be smoother. Uh, our relationship with the uh, powers of the, of the European continent and with the EU as an institution will be more constructive or there will be a basis for it. If we have a no-deal Brexit and we're three weeks away from that possibility, um, then ever, all bets are off, it will be hostile, we will probably try and uh, uh, make life awkward for them in, in uh, relations between NATO and the EU. Gentlemen, have a good flight. And yes, they have to leave us. I know you're not being rude I in not listening to, to me. And I know you really agree now. with everything I'm saying. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and uh, two weeks ago, um, or three weeks ago, John Bolton, remember him, was in London, and he started to present the bill to the UK. If you want, you know, yeah, you want a trade relationship? We want a very good trade relationship with the UK, he said. Um, first thing on the agenda was align with our policy on Iran. Second thing on the agenda was align with our policy on Huawei. Now, whatever you think about the merits of either of those cases, the reality is that for the last several years under conservative governments, or conservative-led governments, and under Labour governments, the UK's foreign policy on all of these issues, Israel, Palestine, Iran, relations with China, the mixture of containment and engagement, uh, climate change, multilateralism, trade, has been, our knee has jerked absolutely in lockstep with the knee of the European Union consensus. And so we're going to, our knee is going to be wrenched in a different direction, and the United States, which we will desperately need in a relationship that we continue to consider to be special, I think more special than it's seen in Washington, uh, will we, we'll demand a price. Um, I was in Washington last week. Um, there wasn't much talk about Brexit or, or Europe. Uh, it was mainly around impeachment. But I went to see people in, in the government to talk about transatlantic defense industry cooperation, one of the questions we were asked. And um, my interlocutor said, well, in the old days, you know, we could have counted on you guys to block this in the EU. So clearly the Americans are experiencing a sense of loss um, uh, and would like to have been able to continue to use the UK to thwart some things that they don't like in the EU. Defense cuts read my lips. If there is a no-deal Brexit, there will have to be defense cuts. It may not come immediately, but it will come sooner rather than later. I don't think they will affect the enhanced forward presence and uh, uh, the defense of Northeastern Europe. Um, this government, incidentally, not only carried out swinging defense uh, cuts in um, 2010, or its, its conservative-led predecessor did, but it also tried to cancel, or it looked into canceling one of the aircraft carriers and discovered that the contracts had been written so cleverly that it would cost more to cancel them than to keep them. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have, to, we have to finish here. Unfortunately, time is over. No more questions. Thank you very much. Half of the panelists ran away already. But thank you nevertheless. And let's, uh, let's give the applause to everybody. Uh, Claire Moody, Dr. Julian Lewis, uh, Julian Lindley French, and uh, Paul Taylor. And uh, I just wonder, just quick answer. Anything will happen 31st of October? Yes or no? Yes or no? <laughs> uh, Probably not, <laughs> but not well, swearing to it. I hope quick. Answer. I hope we will leave with some sort of a deal. But I, I've, I've been serially over optimistic about <laughs> this. Um, so I think probably more extra time will have to be played. Thank you, and see you soon to discuss Brexit again. I think. <laughs>